Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at another Genesis Apologetics video, this one on radiometric dating. Now just a note, in this series they usually present their points using skits as a framing device, but they almost never actually tie the skits into their actual argument, so I just skip most of the skits. This has led to confusion in the past when they reference things that I skip over, such as her saying, Evolution is a blind process, no offense. In this video. My most common comment on this more than two year old video is, why does she say no offense after calling evolution a blind process? It was supposed to be a funny joke because he had just come from the optometrist and was given those eye drops that make your vision blurry for a few hours. Ha ha! Well, I'm skipping their skip from this one too, so if there are any throwaway lines that don't make sense, that's why. So let's go! Phone call. Now, I just left that bit of their skit in to show you what they think of the intellectual abilities of their audience. Apparently, they don't think their audience would be able to make the connection between a phone ringing and it being a phone call. Though, to be fair, nobody really makes phone calls anymore, so maybe they were just being extra explicit so that in the future when all phone calls have become obsolete, people will understand why he starts talking into his phone with it pressed up against his ear like a weirdo. I've noticed this is one of the most heated battles, this whole dating issue. Well, that's because time is at the foundation for everything evolutionary theory teaches. Sort of? I mean, it is true that evolution requires a lot of time. The foundation of evolution, though, are the well-understood mechanisms of how it works. In fact, evolution is so well understood at this point that I would say that the theory of evolution counts as part of the evidence for an old Earth. Life had time to evolve to what we see today, therefore Earth must be at least old enough for life to develop and diversify. The other sciences didn't have to come to the same conclusion about the age of the Earth, but they did. So it all works together as evidence for an old Earth. Look, just read this section right here. Evolution takes a long time. If life has evolved, then Earth must be very fat. Uh, I mean old. See, there we go. I skipped the part where she weighed herself and now she's referencing it. But yes, evolution takes a long time, so the Earth had to be at least old enough for the amount of evolution that we have documented to have happened. Geologists now use radioactivity to establish the age of certain rocks and fossils. Yes. Some 46 to 48 years after Darwin published Origin of the Species, the first paper documenting a radioactive dating method was published. So let's ignore the fact that geologists had already demonstrated that the Earth is at least a few million years old at this point, and pretend that evolution was the only line of evidence for an old Earth at the time. Radiometric dating could easily have come back with young ages and conclusively refuted the theory of evolution. But it didn't. It supported the theory by demonstrating that the Earth has in fact been around long enough for life to have evolved. This kind of data could have shown that the Earth is young. If that had happened, Darwin's ideas would have been refuted and abandoned. Exactly! The scientists who developed radiometric dating were not trying to prove evolution. They were just trying to nail down ages for the formation of various rocks. In fact, in the first paper they go out of their way to point out many of the problems that they encountered which would have to be solved. For instance, they were dating the minerals using uranium lead dating, but the half-life for uranium was unknown at the time of publication, so they used the half-life of radium instead. We have, of course, calculated the half-life of uranium since 1907, and uranium lead dating is now one of the most accurate radiometric dating methods we have. Instead, radioactive dating indicates the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Plenty of time for evolution and natural selection to take place. Yep, exactly. We have never found a dating method that has ever come back with ages that are too young for evolution. And the best that creationists can do in these situations is to point to something that is impressive but fairly young, and then declare that because this one thing is young, the Earth must be young too. Like the Great Barrier Reef, which is actually about 500,000 years old, but its current structure is about 8,000 years old. So they'll claim it to be about 4,200 years old, and then declare this as evidence for a young Earth, as if the planet can be dated by the age of one of its marine ecosystems. That'd be like using the last time someone shaved as a way of figuring out how old they are. It just doesn't even begin to make sense. Wow, it seems that the foundation of evolutionary theory sure depends on radiometric dating. No, it doesn't depend on it, rather it is supported by it. If you were to find some fatal flaw in radiometric dating that completely invalidates all of them as dating methods, 
that would require significant scientific reevaluation of a great many things. But there is plenty of evidence for old ages outside of radiometric dating. Radiometric dating is used to support the belief that millions of years exist for evolution to happen. Yep. No, radiometric dating is used to date rocks so we can figure out the picture of what the Earth was like in the past. The fact that this picture of Earth in the past is one that supports evolution was something that, were evolution not true, did not have to happen. But it did, because evolution is true. And like they said, the entire age of the Earth rests upon radiometric dating. The concept of deep time had its origins in the 1700s, as geologists came to realize that the complexity of the geologic strata and the fossils it contains could not be accounted for by Noah's flood. By the end of the 1700s, James Hutton had concluded that the Earth was infinitely old. He was wrong, of course, but my point here is that geologists from several centuries ago were able to tell that the Earth was vastly greater than 6,000 years old, before radioactivity was even conceived of. The youngest estimate to come out of the 1700s was 75,000 years old. Not old enough for evolution, but still an order of magnitude older than you guys are claiming. It sure seems that they're putting a lot of faith in something that they can't actually test through direct observation. How is it not direct observation? We observe the rate at which uranium decays into lead. We observe uranium and lead in rocks. We observe the ratio of uranium to lead. We observe other minerals from the same strata of the same location and compare their uranium and lead content to account for any lead that might have been present when the rocks were first formed. And we calculate the age of the rocks based on all of these direct observations. After all, plenty of assumptions go into these calculations. They are assumptions to a degree. For instance, the decay rate of uranium. Nobody has been alive for the 4.47 billion years that is the half-life of uranium to have seen an actual half of it decay into lead. However, we are able to measure the rate at which it decays in real time. And this has been done several times over, and has always come out the same within a reasonable margin for error. And this is not an assumption that we just measured once and then assumed to be true from then on out. It is regularly recalculated and remeasured, and the literature is re-reviewed. One of the most recent publications on this was in 2018. Which is actually more recent than this Genesis Apologetics video, come to think of it. And given how long scientific research normally takes to go from the researchers doing their thing to being published in a journal, this probably means that they were actively testing that assumption while these guys were filming this video claiming that it's all based on baseless assumptions. If it were to be disproved, their whole world view would seem to collapse. If you were to demonstrate that radiometric dating is fundamentally flawed, then we would need to reevaluate our dates for a lot of different things. And yes, it might even call the age of the Earth into question. But as stated, we have several other lines of evidence that lead us to believe that the Earth is old. So while that would throw a wrench into a lot of different things, it would not even come close to disproving evolution or to proving a young Earth. Without billions of years, you can't have biological evolution or geological evolution on Earth. What, pray tell, is geological evolution? Are you referring to the rock cycle, or just geologic processes in general? Because, like I said earlier, these geologic processes were the first line of evidence that geologists use to demonstrate that the Earth is old. Pretty epic, eh? So, based on their dating methods, they've come up with an age for each section of the geologic column that we find on the very next page. Allow me to slightly rephrase that to be more accurate. A combination of absolute and relative dating methods has been used to determine ages for the geologic timescale, which had already been divided by geologists into several segments well before radiometric dating came along. Radiometric dating just allowed us to determine more accurate ages for these segments, which can be found in the geologic timescale on the next page. And as a special bonus, if you pause their video at the first frame after they start showing the textbook page, you can see that it is labeled geologic timescale, not geologic column. And based on that, they determined the age of the Earth to be about 4.5 billion years old. Yeah, based on radiometric dating methods. To the best of my knowledge, that is the most accurate method that has been used to date the Earth itself at this point. Actually, the age of the Earth is based on the dating of certain meteorites. Yes, meteorites have been used. Most notably the Canyon Diablo meteorites. And while I'm sure you're going to take issue with the assumption that the rock that formed the meteorite was formed at the same time as the Earth, it is a valid assumption. You see, the universe is a huge place, and most of it is empty. So when you see a bunch of matter in the same location, it stands to reason that this matter all shares an origin, it's all there for the same reason. 
In the case of our solar system, everything originated from the same dust cloud some 4.5 billion years ago that was likely compressed by a shockwave from a nearby supernova to form our sun. Since the universe is so empty, the vast majority of the materials that we will see in our solar system would share the same origin story. And, in fact, meteorites are far less likely to be contaminated by geologic processes while floating around in space, so they could very well be more accurate than using any of the rocks that we find on Earth for dating. They assume these meteorites formed at the same time as the Earth and that dating the meteorites will give us the age of the Earth. Yes, because everything in the solar system formed at the same time. Sure, there is a chance that some matter in the solar system had extrasolar origins, but such matter would be in the extreme minority. And since this is a calculation that has been performed many times on many different samples, the chance that all of these samples are extrasolar in origin is minuscule. And of course, there are ways of telling whether or not a meteorite is of extrasolar origin, and we have found meteorites that have their origin elsewhere in the universe. But all of this aside, if we just assume that all the meteorites and moon rocks that we have used to figure out the age of the Earth are actually wrong and of extrasolar origin, we can just go to Jack Hills, Australia and hunt for zircons, which from that area have been dated to 4.4 billion years old. So complain all you want about the meteorites, the Earth is still at least 4.4 billion years old if we exclude all the extraterrestrial data. With that as a start, they then construct the ages of the layers in the column based primarily on the layers of volcanic ash and igneous rock. Yeah, they absolutely date the layers that can be absolutely dated, and figure out dates for the other layers using relative dating methods from there. Wow, so they don't even use rock from Earth. I guess there is another assumption you don't hear about in class. For those of you not looking at your screens who would have missed the subtitles there, they thought that it would be a good idea to have her speaking through a cookie. What she said was, so they don't even use rocks from Earth? I guess that's another assumption you don't hear about in class. Yeah, rocks that originated on the Earth would not have been used to get us the age of the Earth, because any rock originating on Earth would necessarily be younger than the Earth as a whole. So meteorites are actually a more accurate measurement of the age. But even if you don't want to use meteorites because you feel like that's an assumption and no scientist has ever thought that maybe the meteorite wasn't formed at the same time as the solar system, we still have a 4.4 billion year old planet from zircon crystals. So, for the test, could you remind me about how radiometric dating works? Sure. Can you hand me my water bottle? Wow, this thing's still half frozen. Mm hmm Now, pretend the water bottle is a rock. Jane, what are you doing? Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, I'll do his analogy for him. Water bottle with frozen water in it is a rock. The ice is uranium. The liquid water is lead. You can tell how long ago the bottle of water was taken out of the freezer by measuring the rate at which the water is melting and using that measurement to calculate how long it would have taken for that much water to melt. So, when they discover a rock, they can measure the amount of parent material and the amount of daughter product, and using a chart like this, determine how old it is. That's oversimplified, but yes, basically. So, what's wrong with this method? <laughs> well, the methods measure only the amounts of isotopes in the rock. This is good science because it is observable and repeatable. It just gives the ratio of one element to another. But, the age is an interpretation of those measurements, not an observation. No, the age is not an interpretation of those measurements, it is a calculation based on those measurements. You don't have to stare at a rock from its formation until the present day in order to determine how old it is. You can use these radioactive isotopes. And oftentimes, such as in the meteorites that you mentioned earlier, they will date these rocks with several different independent radiometric elements, and they will all come back with the same number within a reasonable margin for error. So in the case of the Canyon Diablo meteorites, they use three different dating methods using different elements that all have a different decay rate to do their calculations, and all three methods yielded the same result. The most parsimonious explanation for that is that the result is accurate. And that interpretation assumes answers to all kinds of untested questions. What if the rock already had a daughter isotope in it from the very beginning? That's when isochron dating becomes useful. Coincidentally, they also used isochron dating when dating the Canyon Diablo meteorite. So a brief explanation of isochron dating. They will take multiple samples from multiple different locations of minerals that are the same age, so in the same geologic strata, or in the case of the meteorites, from the same source impact event. 
Then, when dating the material, they don't just look at the parent and daughter isotopes, they also look at elements of the daughter isotope that are non-radiogenic. That is, not the product of radioactive decay. When rocks are forming, the minerals are indiscriminate about the different isotopes that will be included in the mineral. To the forming mineral, lead-206 is just as good as lead-204, but only one of those is also the result of radiometric decay. So because the ratio is fixed when the rocks form, you can figure out how much of the daughter isotope was already present in the rock when it formed by comparing the ratio of the daughter isotope to the non-radiogenic daughter isotope to the ratio of the parent isotope to the non-radiogenic daughter isotope. When you plot the ratios taken from these different samples on a graph, if there has been no contamination, the graph will be linear, and the slope of the line can be used to calculate the age of the sample. This is a difficult concept to explain quickly, so if you want a better explanation, I recommend my video on dating methods. The part on isochron dating starts at 8 minutes and 50 seconds. Or what if the rock gets contaminated? There are signs that are left behind when rocks get contaminated. In order to contaminate a rock, it has to be heated to a point where it would allow additional inclusion of these elements, or the escape of elements that are already there. Such heating is not subtle. The rock would likely be partially metamorphosed. And also, if using an isochron diagram, the line that you plot would not be linear. So yeah, contamination is a possibility, but it usually leaves detectable signs behind, and when dating rocks with multiple methods, it is nigh impossible for both elements to contaminate the rock in such a way as to produce the exact same result when plugged into their respective calculations. Or what if the rate of decay was rattled at some point in the past? There is no evidence that anything can affect the decay rates. We have tried, and we still calculate them regularly and repeatedly just to make sure. The kinds of events that would be needed to change the apparent radioactive decay rate would leave us with bigger problems than just the wrong dates for rocks. I'm talking like the rocks would have had to have moved at near light speeds relative to the Earth so that relativity would make them age differently, or the Earth would have to move at near light speeds relative to the rocks. Neither scenario is plausible. And whatever happened to change the radioactive decay rates would have had to have affected all of the radioactive elements in different proportions so that they still all came up with the same numbers when performing our dating calculations on them. Again, the most parsimonious conclusion here is that they have not changed, rather than they have all changed in different amounts that make their independent equations line up perfectly with each other. What was the original ratio of parent to daughter isotope? That can be determined by analyzing and comparing samples from other minerals that were formed in the same event, both for elements that can have the isochron diagram applied to them and those that cannot. Are those assumptions wrong? I mean, if you start with false assumptions, you could get really bad dates. Yeah, which is why we use different dating methods to cross-reference each other. Also, as pointed out, those aren't all assumptions. Some of them are calculations. The only one that's really an assumption is that the decay rates don't change, and that is an assumption that is constantly being retested, and no evidence has ever surfaced that shows it to be an error. Well, many scientists think they are, and our textbooks don't even tell us about all the assumptions required to date the rock. Because there's really only one assumption, that the decay rates are constant, and even that isn't really an assumption. Sure, the textbooks don't go into great detail about how we can tell when rocks have been contaminated, but there are ways. We can even, at least sometimes, tell how much contamination is present, sometimes by using a different dating method. So for potassium-argon dating, if there is contamination, an analysis of the different isotopes of argon, argon-40 and argon-30, will not only reveal the fact that it has been contaminated, but you can figure out just how much argon is the result of contamination. But the most convincing evidence is all the crazy dates they get with radioisotope methods. Oh yay! This is where you guys list poorly sourced artifacts, or samples that were dated with the wrong method and whatnot. Great. To be fair, there are lots of dates that agree with one another, but there are many examples of different mineral components of a rock giving very different radiometric dates. Yeah, sometimes when you date the components of a rock using different methods, you can get different dates for the different components. So in igneous rock, there are sometimes inclusions of older rock crystals that were formed before the igneous rock itself. Sometimes these can be dated radiometrically, and sometimes they cannot and will produce weird results. And often, creationists love to use these examples as proof that radiometric dating doesn't work, like in my video on gradient commercial, where he pointed out a lava flow that had all kinds of weird dates returned for its olivine xenolith inclusions. But the xenoliths were being dated specifically to check whether or not the dating method could be used for olivine xenoliths. In the conclusion of the paper, they came back with a no, because the samples were contaminated in the magma chamber. And as one would expect from a contamination event, 
different. These contaminations happen differently in different amounts to the different rocks, yielding wildly different dates for those inclusions, thereby lending extra credibility to the results that ended up agreeing with each other, because when we do detect contamination, it always makes the dates disagree with each other, never agree. And very often, different isotope systems give different ages for the same rock. And usually in those instances, it's an example of creationists sending samples to labs to be dated using the wrong method, which then returns an incorrect result, which is to be expected. So how can you know which one is the right age, if any? Well, if multiple methods give you different ages that are outside of their margins for error, and the sample was properly documented, you would then use relative dating methods to figure out which absolute dating method came closer to the correct answer, and then continue the examination of the sample in order to figure out exactly what caused your date to be off. You do not just arbitrarily decide which age you like better, and then decide that that's the correct one. And then there are rocks we know the age of, where we watched it cool from lava, that give radically older dates. Oh, here comes Mount St. Helens. Yeah, when you date inclusions in the cooled lava flow from recent eruptions, you can get older dates for those inclusions, because those are older rocks. Really? Yeah. A lava flow in a volcano of the North Island of New Zealand that happened in 1954 was dated to be 3.5 million years old. Okay, not Mount St. Helens. Fun fact though, when looking up this article by Andrew Snelling, I noticed that it has a table in it with some familiar data. Well, would you look at that? There's Sunset Crater that we talked about with McMurtry. If you missed it, the ages given here are from the wrong column of Table 2 of the original paper, where Steve Austin in 1996 seems to have mistakenly reported the amount of excess argon as the age. Which, you know, fine, fair enough, he just looked at the wrong column when he wrote his article. It's an easy enough mistake to make, though it's definitely one that would have been noticed during the peer review phase of any legitimate journal before publication. But then, because creationists don't usually do their own footwork, instead relying on rephrasing other people's work and presenting it as if it's their own, this mistake has made its way through the creationist circles, and this is now the fourth page that it is still up, available, and uncorrected, which has just copied Steve Austin's original mistake from 24 years ago. But of course, excess argon is still a problem that potassium argon dating has to deal with. Now I'm not about to read through the entire paper that Snelling cites here as giving the dates for the lava flow, it's over 300 pages long, but by skimming through it, I did find that that particular lava flow has an unusual abundance of quartzo-feldspathic xenoliths in varying stages of assimilation. In lay people speak, a xenolith is part of an igneous rock that does not share the origin of that igneous rock. In fact, when I searched for the name of the volcano that Snelling is talking about, I only ever found it as either the caption for the picture of the volcano, or in paragraphs discussing xenoliths and inclusions, which suggests to me that the anomalous dates are for xenoliths and inclusions rather than the lava flow itself. Creationists seem to be able to find new eruptions to examine fairly easily, but it all comes back to the same issue. They look at dates obtained for the older material that was included in the eruption, ignore the part where geologists explicitly state that they are examining these older inclusions, pull dates from these inclusions, and claim that radiometric dating doesn't work because the dates from the lava flow are older than they should be. So, once again, one side of the argument has to completely misrepresent the other side in order to make their point. Wow, that's really off. Yeah, I'll say. If I weren't so charitable, I might say they were purposely lying rather than misunderstanding. The more I learn about these arguments, the harder it is for me to believe that the people that started them actually believe their own nonsense. Snelling and Austin are both qualified geologists, yet somehow they don't know the difference between a lava flow and the inclusions or xenoliths within that flow? A 10-year-old rock from Mount St. Helens Lava Dome dated to 350,000 years and older. Yeah, all the same stuff applies here. I just left this part in so that you could see that I was actually right when I said Mount St. Helens was coming. If we can't trust radiometric dating on rocks that we can see formed, then how can we trust radiometric dating on rocks that we can see formed? Rocks that supposedly formed a million years ago. Isochron dating takes care of most of the problems of radiometric dating, so even if you were to throw all the methods that can't use an isochron diagram out the window, we still have a reliable dating method that pegs the Earth at a few billion years old. Add on to that all the non-radiometric dating methods like relative dating, stratigraphy, electron spin resonance, radioluminescence, electrical conductivity, and so on, and yeah, looks like the Earth is older than 6,000 years. Okay, this rock was taken from the Ono Formation near Redding, California, where millions of sea fossils have been found. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no!
Oh, no! Oh, yeah! This lower Cretaceous rock is supposed to be about 112 million years old. But the marine fossil stuck inside the mud rock, an ammonite. Before you go on to your crummy dating, my prediction here is that they'll have dated this millions of years old sea creature using carbon dating. I just want to say that if you aren't lying or mistaken about how old that rock is supposed to be, the ammonite in it will have lobes with subdivided tips and rounded undivided saddles. I know this because those characteristics are indicative of Cretaceous ammonites. Feel free to have it examined to see if I'm right showed 36,000 radiocarbon years. Yeah, there you go. If you carbon date something that is too old to be carbon dated, you get weird results. Also, this won't really be applicable here, but the carbon dating of marine organisms is known to be flawed because of the reservoir effect. You'll notice that creationists usually default to carbon dating marine organisms when trying to disprove carbon dating because marine organisms, or non-marine organisms whose diet largely consists of marine organisms, will have different amounts of carbon than non-marine organisms because of the reservoir effect. This skews the dates older and makes things look older than they are. So in this case, the reservoir effect isn't really coming into play because it's more that you're sending a millions of years old sample to be dated using a method that's only good for up to 50,000 years. So you're a couple orders of magnitude off. How can a rock be 112 million years old if it holds a fossil of only 36,000 years using a different method? Because you used a method that is known not to work at those ages. Also, being a fossil, any carbon that would have been in it has been replaced by minerals. To borrow a turn of phrase from Potholer54, Oi! We can't carbon date this! There's no fucking carbon in it! I wonder if either date is meaningful. Seems kinda suspicious to me. You're right. It sure does sound suspicious that you would have a sample dated using a method that is known not to work on samples of that age, which wouldn't even work if carbon's half-life were longer because of the lack of carbon in it to begin with, and then present the results of that carbon dating as if they are somehow meaningful. Hey, at the jewelry store, the science said diamonds take billions of years to form deep beneath the earth. Yeah, at the jewelry store. Because the truth of the matter when it comes to diamond formation is that we don't actually know how long diamonds take to form. But jewelers would like you to believe that the more expensive naturally occurring diamonds are better than man-made diamonds, so they have a financial incentive to make you think they're more rare than they actually are. And as part of that, they say they take billions of years to form. Now, the vast majority of naturally occurring diamonds were brought to the surface of the Earth through a type of volcanic eruption that was incredibly violent and doesn't happen anymore, as it required the warmer temperatures that were found on the early Earth several billion years ago. So the diamonds that we mine today are billions of years old, but we don't say that because it took them billions of years to form. This is because that's how long ago these eruptions took place. So yes, we know that it is hypothetically possible for diamonds to form in a matter of hours, and it is possible that some diamonds of the Earth did form that quickly, but at the end of the day, the process of diamond formation is not a clock that we use to date the Earth. I doubt that. Researchers find carbon-14 in diamonds. Yeah, they do. Do you know why? Because diamonds are basically pure carbon. Okay, but all the radioactive carbon-14 should have decayed over the billions of years that the diamonds have been hanging out, right? Right. But background radiation interacts with nitrogen impurities in the diamonds to produce more carbon-14 in the same reaction that gives us carbon-14 in the atmosphere. So yeah, no problems there. Why is that important? Radiocarbon decays quickly. It has a half-life of only about 5,730 years. So its maximum shelf life is only about 100,000 years before it becomes undetectable. So you are aware of the limitations on how far back you can date things using carbon dating then? Why did you provide carbon dates for a millions of years old fossil as if it were meaningful somehow if you are aware of the limitations? And it might be impossible to contaminate an old diamond with young carbon. Yeah, but did you see the little animation that you had in your own video? The one where carbon-14 decays into nitrogen inside the diamond? That process is reversible. If it were not reversible, we wouldn't have any carbon-14 on Earth at all, because the reversal of that process is what gives us all of the carbon-14 that we have. None of us were there to verify the assumptions. But God has provided a written account of history. 
And if you tally up all the chronologies and time cues in the Bible, the earth is about 6,000 years old. Yeah, let's trust an old book that gives you numbers that are more than a thousand years off from each other, depending on which translation you start with, and which doesn't actually explicitly state the age of the earth anywhere, which also has a global flood happening during a time period when several civilizations were alive and well without interruption, and this global flood also left absolutely no evidence for itself in the geologic record. Yeah. That book has got to be much more accurate than isochron dating, which will automatically result in a skewed graph if any of its parameters or assumptions are wrong. Or dendrochronology, which, if anything, makes trees appear younger than they are, as missing rings are a far greater problem for them than extra rings. Or the visual stratigraphy of ice cores, which can be coordinated with stratigraphic markers from other fields of study, like dendrochronology and marine sedimentology. Let's also ignore the fact that to make radiometric dating look bad, creationists have to regularly either have samples dated using the wrong methods, or completely misrepresent the studies that they quote from in order to make them look bad. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Joni Hansky, who says, Vice Rhino thinking determinism and free will being incompatible. It's sad case of philosophy. And then the video based on the silly high school edgy teenager misunderstanding of philosophy. Yes, I am aware that compatibilism is a thing. For context, this was on a video where the apologist was arguing that evil exists because free will is a thing, so when God created Satan, he was creating a being that had free choice, and would eventually freely choose evil. Compatibilism is basically just the idea that free will and determinism are not mutually exclusive. You can believe in both without there being a logical contradiction. Thing is though, I wasn't arguing against compatibilism in that video. Compatibilism isn't the issue here. That's where it might be possible for a being to know everything that we are going to do and we still have free will. The issue is that it's not just that God knows all the choices that everyone will make, it's that he is also responsible for creating everything and knows the consequences of every one of his own choices. Sure, I can accept that an all-knowing being could exist and we could still have free will. But if this all-knowing being is also responsible for having made everything, that's where the issue comes in. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, especially Mark McManus, who are the carbon-14 in my diamonds. If you'd like to make me look younger than I am, you can support the channel for as little as $1 per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!